Hi, everybody. Hi. I know we were just introduced, but I'm Tony. And I'm Liz. my sister, Liz. We're siblings. We're siblings, and we're here to talk about Two sex. Two of six. <laughs> but he's the only one that will talk to me about sex in a public that's, that's situation. True. <laughs> yeah, we have, there are six siblings in our family. And, um, you know, before we really get started, I do, uh, can I just, who, have, has anybody in the room already read this book? A few of you have. I really want to recommend, the, I'm really proud of Liz for this book that, that she wrote, Sex, Health, and Consciousness. Um, it is, um, you know, I'm quite a bit older than Liz, and I learned a tremendous Considerably. Amount, considerably. <laughs> I learned a tremendous amount, and what I love about this book is it is, um, it deals with, you know, subject matter that is on everyone's mind, is a huge part of everyone's life, um, and it is both a kind of has a lot of really practical information that you just don't hear people talking about a lot. And also, it is deeply personal to Liz. You know, for me, reading books in, the, in this kind of space, often I get uh, fed up with them because either they are so prescriptive, like, here's, I have the answer, and I am the expert, and I'm going to tell you what's what. And, uh, and or, or they... They tend to, um, uh, you know, make you have you walk away feeling that you have had a, sh a kind of a shot of dopamine, like, oh my God, I've had a revelation, and I, now I understand, and then it kind of wears off. Do you know what I mean? It has, a, it feels gimmicky to me oftentimes. And Liz's book is very unique to me because it's, um, like I said, it's it's practical, but it's all filtered through not only Liz's personal lens, um, but it doesn't. It's all about, um, the, you know, the fact that. We're all trying to figure this thing out together for our entire lives. And um, so I just, I really recommend it. And, what did you uh, learn? What was one thing you learned that you didn't know oh, before? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the la like, I know what you learned recently oh, about dick pics. Yeah, I we know. talked about dick pics already. <laughs> Why are you obsessed with me and dick pics? I don't, I don't well, because I also had to explain to him OnlyFans. He didn't know what OnlyFans was. That I did not even know. And that know you could was. charge money for rating dick pics. No, I did know what a dick pic was. No, you didn't. I just. <laughs> He was like, why would anyone want to have their dick rated? Or why would you yeah. send someone a picture of their dick, of your dick I unsolicited? Because he's honestly, he's really nice. It. And he's kind well, of naive. We weren't going to get there so fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying that, to break that the ice. True, I am nice. And perhaps I am naive. But I came of age because I'm considerably older than Liz. I came of age in the 70s and 80s. Like there was quaaludes and stuff, right? There was quaaludes and stuff. And like there was, <laughs> there was, a, there was lot of, a lot of sex. There was a lot of sex. There was it was well, pre apparently there was much more sex happening right. than apparently is happening now. I mean, I just read this article in the Times last week that people are having a lot less sex, particularly young people, than when I was coming up. But the idea of dick pics, and obviously there weren't even like cell phones, so people needed to connect personally. So IRL. we're, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Um, but I, but before we do, I, I want to kind of steer back cause I'm <laughs> uh, away from dick pics. <laughs> no, cause one of the things I want to make sure we He's talk never about. never sent a dick pic. I just want to clarify that. I have not. I have not. It's true. And I'm not ashamed of it either, but you know, life's Has not over yet. You're nude on stage and in film. I have. Yes. Right. Anyways, back to the subjects. <laughs> um, so, but I did want to talk uh, about one of the things that you really dig into in the in the book. Since I am your brother and I am a man, and honestly, Liz and I do talk about this subject a lot: sex, health, and consciousness. So you should hang out around our dinner table. <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk about masculinity because you know this is a book also that I felt is you know it. One might think it's more feminine geared because it's written by a woman and there's a lot about being a woman in this book and women's sexuality, but there's also a lot about men and Liz's relationship with men. And um, there's a, I'm fascinated by the transformation of masculinity in our present time. You know, um, it really seems like we're going through a real sea change of what masculinity means, what masculinity 
is welcome, <laughs> what men, masculinity is appealing, what masculinity is not appealing, and I think a lot of guys are quite confused uh, uh, about that. I know I often am. Uh, and um, you write in the book, and I'm going to kick it over to you, about having grown up in what you, I don't know, that, I guess I would agree with you, but I'd never thought of it this way, in a family of alpha males. Yeah. That Liz, is, we, we have an older sister, but the rest of us, that's all guys. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm curious how you, how, how that impacted you and um, led you kind of, did, is that something that you know, led you into this work? I mean, you, last thing I'll say is you mentioned in the book that an awakening for you was finding our father's Playboy magazines when you were a little girl. Yeah. And that had, I of course never found the Playboy magazine. So Liz <laughs> looked a lot harder look. than me. So, but yeah. do, would you, like, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about Yeah, that. I mean, obviously from my perspective, I grew up in a boys club in Hollywood. I think we all know now there's been a reckoning, you know, in the last like five years. But when I was growing up, it was very clear to me, um, not only within our family, but what, how far you could get in that system, in that world, um, if you were not a white man. No offense. I love you. I love my brothers. I loved, I loved my dad, but he was from another time. And sometimes I think about the conversations we'd, we would have now, like post Me Too, post Time's Up. Um, and that was really hard for me to grow up in a way where me as a human being or as an artist was constantly being measured against the success that the men in my family had earned and my father and my grandfather and kind of feeling like even with this work I actually my first job was at Planned Parenthood at 13 and I bought the domain names for the sex ed my company in 2008 but for some reason I thought I can't do this work until I'm in my 60s until after I've proven myself in like my, the men in my family's game. And it was kind of all about measuring my success within the patriarchy. I had to really look at my own internalized patriarchy and come to a place where, you know, I realized that this is my life's work, this is my mission. And that I was only kind of pursuing things in, in the media in that way to like, I guess, be seen as equal, but then, I never could, right? Because the system wasn't really set up for me to succeed in that way. And I think for a long time I felt angry and resentful about it. And I was on, you know, this like toxic masculinity trip. But I really feel, and I have to credit the great Bell Hooks. Are, is, are any of you familiar with Bell Hooks writing? All About Love is one of my favorite books. And she has an incredible book on masculinity too. But I really think it's more about wounded masculinity, not toxic, because men are, have been kept in boxes too. And they've been denied the ability to be nurtured and loved and supported and from an early age to be able to name their emotions. Um, you know, they're told r rage or frustration. Um, so I think, you know, coming up in like Hollywood in that lens in a family of like very successful, strong men, it was, it was definitely, it taught me, it took me on a journey around masculinity and I kind of finally feel in the last few years I've come to a place where um, I think I've, let, I've dropped a lot of that desire to like prove myself. Or comp I mean, you and I never really competed, you know? I competed with you. you <laughs> no, we didn't, we, we've always been, but you, you re I think you have a phrase in the book that I thought was really interesting is it called divine masculinity you refer to? And I'm really, I need to know what that is. I need to understand what, like, what does that mean to you? I'm kidding. What does that mean to you versus what obviously to you was a kind of a, a version of masculinity that was a, oppressive to you and you felt, so what in our modern context do you, like what are the elements of divine masculinity to you? Okay, so putting aside the whole idea that, I mean, gender is a construct. I feel we've moved beyond the binary and it is a little outdated to speak in like, you know, man, woman, masculine, feminine, because we all have that yin yang duality within each of us. Right. And we want to that for me, for that to be in balance. Like I think I actually had was sort of more masculine growing up because I just had all these brothers. Right. 
Um, and so you had to scrap because, you know, at the dinner table, everyone was like eating their food like this. So you could, yeah, it was who got the biggest slice of pie? Oh, well, maybe you weren't because you're the nice one. <laughs> and he doesn't compete with anyone. Um, but I would say divine masculinity allows the possibility of vulnerability, allows the possibility of like being really being in touch with your soul, of being able to be open, to be nurtured, uh, and to be nurturing, and all the things that we've traditionally denied men. Um, you know, we tell them to suck it up, don't cry, be a man. Um, I think that there's also a lot tied into performance and sexual performance for men, which, you know, porn has done a lot to uh, amplify. Um, there was a famous rapper who I won't name, but he had a sex tape leaked. He's married to someone very famous who recently um, revealed her pregnancy in a very public way. <laughs> but he had a sex tape, tape leaked a number of years ago and the internet was agog saying like he didn't have, like his stroke game was off. And I was just thinking about it, like there's so much pressure on a man to perform, to get hard, to keep it up, to have, you know, and I don't think, I often have to remind heterosexual female friends of mine in long-term relationships that men have feelings, that, you know, we can't hold, if we want to change the paradigm, we also have to make sure we're thinking about what we're putting out there, what kind of messaging we're putting out there for men, that they're just supposed to always be able to perform, that they're, you know, that there's, their dick is always linked to their brain. And I don't necessarily, I don't think that's the case. Well, there's a lot, uh, one of the other things I really loved about the book is it's sort of, um, <clears throat> you have tremendous compassion for the struggles that we all go through and male, female, non-binary, whatever, are, you know, gay, straight, what, uh, but, and, and one of the commonalities for all of us is the, the way that sex uh, is so associated with shame in our culture and, you know, in our ancestral DNA, mm -hmm. and, um, and we're all, in some version, wrestling with that. And I, I'm also, you know, you and I have talked a lot about porn and, and you, you know, Liz, from when you first kind of started getting into this space, it was, um, at least from my awakening, Liz's first big project that I was aware of in this space was a, an amazing documentary she made for HBO called Pretty Things, which was about the, the, the last burlesque queens who were um, old ladies and Liz wanted to interview them before they all died because she was, you know, but you're, and there, it's a really great, I really highly recommend it, and she did a book to follow it that's a great kind of art book uh, on this subject. But you're fascinated. All those books, Tony. All those books, and, yeah, <laughs> and there are books, this is in the lobby, please buy it. Um, uh, I'm curious about a lot of things, but the, you're, you had this early fascination with burlesque dancers and strippers and a kind of a version of female sexuality which would seem to be to some degree male gaze in the male gaze exactly in some sense defined by or catered to by by the patriarchy and you know and i've always found that tension curious and and interesting and um you know uh, we talked about this so much when you were making it but uh, i don't know can do you want to talk about that because there's there's a lot about porn in this book and you know I'm the other thing that I find really interesting is this nexus between porn has its role as you say but it also is fantasy and and reality are a completely separate thing and can be a real barrier between actual human connection and uh I don't know I'm just curious to talk about your journey on that on that kind of well it goes back to dad's playboys I think um and the male and the male gaze and like seeing myself you know stealing my dad's playboys and thinking about his objectification of women um god bless him loved him very much he loved women and kind of thinking i guess you know when i think about it now and obviously i've done a lot of therapy um i i think that i learned about my sexuality through those through the way that men looked at women initially and maybe that's what initially drew me into 
wanting to understand um, that world and also wanting to give women and sex workers and people who worked in those worlds back some kind of authority, agency, accolades. Um, because those burlesque queens that you mentioned, like I think I started that project when I was like 17 or 18, that art school in New York City at SVA. And I think the book, the movie came out, I think in 2005 first and the book in 2006. So this is, you know, a while ago now. Um, and those women had not been given their due. Um, you know, at the time when they were famous, this was like pre-television, right? They were, when television came in and they couldn't translate to movies because our, you know, they took their clothes off. Um, it wasn't acceptable, so it was kind of about giving them back some light and showcasing them as performance artists. And the same thing with my last book, which is set in sex work and vice and prostitution in LA in the 1890s, is the same thing. When I think about the choices that women had traditionally for a job um, going back you know, centuries, what was it? You could devote yourself to God, you could be a housewife, you could be a domestic worker, um, or you could ply your trade with what was between your legs. And sometimes that wasn't a choice, and sometimes that was the only choice. So I think it was, you know, just always kind of fascinating to me. And then also, yeah, again, I guess looking at those Playboys and thinking, like, why did Dad have these Playboy magazines? What fascinated him about it? Why did all the grown-ups around me seem so obsessed by this word, sex, that no one would really talk about and no one would explain it, but it clearly led everyone's decision-making process, whether or not they wanted to admit it, and I think it still does for many of us, unless we kind of get a handle on it. Um, because as you and I have talked about extensively, I believe that sexual energy is so much more than penetration or an orgasm or something you even need to have a partner for. It's your creative energy, it's your mana, it's your prana, it's your chi. And I think it can be channeled in all sorts of exciting ways. Well, we, <clears throat> please applaud that one. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier on about um, uh, how today people so apparently are having a lot less sex. And it's so uh, strange to me because it's so much more easily available given our smartphones. That, I mean, I'd like, you know, when, when I w was... When you walked a I, mile I, in the snow. No, no, no. When I walked a mile in the snow to the singles bar and guys were, what you would say like, well, what are you going to say? That, you know, you have to go talk to somebody. And See if, or, or you had- What was your pickup I line? I didn't have one, Liz, you know that. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I had, I had no game. Um, no, but you had- I believe that, actually. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but it seems so readily available with a swipe, okay? So, please explain to me what is going on. You know, what is that? Because to me, there's a connection with the, um, the barrier, in a sense, that technology is it gives you tremendous access, and yet it puts up a barrier both physically, that I'm, you know, it's a virtual experience, and then even when I meet this person, I guess for a hookup, it is transactional, largely, I guess, although everyone I know who has part, you know, my daughters met their boyfriends and who they're now living with online, you know, on their phones, so that, that's great too, but I'm talking about, you know, sex is so available, so how is it that people are having less sex, and how does porn fit into that? Because, you know, we were talking about Pornhub, you know, the, 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 the power base of that company is just, you know, beyond anything. So can you talk, because yeah. you talk about all that in the book. Uh, what do you guys think? Are you having, raise your hand if you're having as much sex as you want to be having. <laughs> <laughs> A few okay, of you. raise your hand if you wish you were having more sex. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the in the book, I reference this TED. Here's a really what? Raise, raise your hand if you wish you were having better sex. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, no one raised that. their hands. <laughs> no. I don't believe they that. With their partner. <laughs> no, <so. laughs> 
Yeah, well, in the book, I reference this TED Talk, which I, I don't know if you, any of you have seen it. It's called Connected But Alone. Um, it's Sherry Tur Turtle, Turkle. I'm going to butcher the name. But it's this whole premise that we're more connected than ever, but we're kind of more alone. Because a lot of people, especially on social media, I see it all the time, will reveal themselves to like hundreds or thousands or millions of their followers and say all of these personal details. But these, a lot of times it's things that they wouldn't actually say to someone face to face. It's kind of awkward and uncomfortable. And I find most people are really uncomfortable talking about sex, um, particularly with their partner, which is insane to me that you'll like lick someone's orifices <laughs> and not tell them what you like, what you don't like, before you have sex, like here are things, here's places I don't like to be touched, or these are some triggers, or these are some experience I've had, because I think the more int intimacy and communication that you have with people, the better sex you can have, um, the safer that you feel. I want people to feel safe having sex. Um, I think that's really essential. And I think when you're talking about the transactional nature of sex, I think it's amazing the way technology has connected us, and particularly so when that people don't feel alone. Because I think, you know, prior to like, I mean, social media has done a lot of detriment, but at the same time, if you were, you know, a queer or trans kid living in a, in a sit not outside of a sub uh, urban center, you didn't see people in your community that looked like you. And I think it's really important to have people mirror our experiences and to, to find community. I think it's essential to find community. And I think that it's essential to find community in real life, too. Um, but yeah, when it comes to a plethora of options, I think now, one, we don't have to choose. I think a lot of people are really desensitized from porn. Um, I don't think porn is a bad thing. I think we're, it's not like, you can't just say it's bad, it needs to go away. That was definitely in my, my we don't have the same mom. But in addition to the like, you know, charming, playboy loving dad, I had a mom who was super feminist um, and like very politically active. So I, I had two extremes and she actually hate, hated porn. And she had a lot of trouble with the work that I do at the beginning. She didn't understand why I was interested in striptease or pornography or all these spaces. Um, so I, I think it's important to be inclusive of people in those industries because they really know a lot about sex and they know a lot about humans. Um, but I think it's, it's difficult when a lot of our sex education is now coming from porn to look at those bodies on screen and look at the performance on screen and compare yourself to it. I think it can really desensitize us to sex. And I think that there is so much, I don't know, I feel and hopefully that we're entering into a new space of healing around these topics. And a lot of us have so much healing to do around the topic of sex, whether that's because we've experienced trauma or we, had a cultural or religious upbringing that you know told us that certain things were taboo or shameful, um, whether that had to do with sex or even our own bodies or, or menstruation. So there's so many different factors, I think, that are contributing to people having less sex than ever. Um, but I, I would hope that eventually that will lead to having healthier, more intentional healing sex. Um, and I think that you can find even th that kind of sex in some of the most unlikely spaces that one may think. Like I have a chapter on bondage and healing in the book. I think that there's a lot of modalities that we don't necessarily associate with healing that are on the kinkier side of sex that can actually provide a lot of healing because when you get into more um, kink-aware, fetish lifestyles, Boundaries tend to be discussed a lot um, more clearly than in like vanilla sex, which I, which is in communication, aftercare, all of these things, which I think should be commonplace in like straight vanilla sex. Yeah. So you you know I'm, you where the the this book. This is my brother that we're talking. <laughs> like I said, this is just Tuesday night dinner. <laughs> <laughs> what, what um, uh, you know, the book uh, has a really beautiful destination about 
really about ultimately the spirituality and the spiritual power of sex and sex as an essential, um, well, you mentioned like chi, like an essential component in transcendent human connection. And that, so, you know, if that's the kind of thing that on a higher level we all are aspiring to in life, right, in choosing a partner, in trying to raise our children, in finding work that makes us feel fulfilled and doing something of meaning in the world and connecting with our, you know, that, that kind of transcendence is something that, you know, sex is both, uh, both a metaphor for and literally, like you said, you know, I think in the book you mentioned that, um, you know, our bodily fluids are like, w w maybe it was an ancient culture that viewed, our, you know, that, like that that's actually the manifestation of chi or, uh, anyway, yeah, I'm just is. saying so, so, so. Semen, blood. So that is, you, you express it very beautifully <laughs> in the book, semen and blood, right, exactly. <laughs> That's blood the title of your next Yeah, book. that's Blood Magic. Blood Magic, okay, good. <laughs> Whatever, uh, yeah. Um, uh, so I want to get into that. That's a whole <laughs> other book. Okay. I, I do have a chapter on menstruation, masturbation, and manifesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I talk about, right. you know, if you want to, you could, and you'd bleed, you could like put a little bit of blood on yourself or in the mm -hmm. garden or in your plants. <laughs> I'm not laughing. I'm not laughing. Uh, but but what, what, here, the, that's what I, I used to I do. Thinking, that's wait, why the roses grew. I don't so want to well. let porn. Okay. <laughs> she has a beautiful rose garden, <laughs> and now you know why. Um, uh, but getting back to the the connection with porn, sex work, and subjects that you get into. I thought in we the were book. on spirituality. No, we are. Okay. I'm, well, I'm I'm curious about the connection between the two because, as you said. Like you don't you don't dismiss porn or say it's bad or that because it's not essentially uh, you know it is in many senses a, a, I mean for me personally I and this is I'm maybe very alone in this I when I look at porn I, it makes me depressed I may get turned on by it but I get really depressed by it so I don't consume porn because for me it is uh, a reminder that I'm all <laughs> a reminder that of, of the lack of communication, the person that I'm objectifying, I, I start to think like, who is that person? Like, what's their deal? Like, what's up with that? Or, or that if it's you're watching a movie, you know, so it feels very de disconnecting to me. And so I, 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 it's, I struggle with it, all right? Because for me, the, the, the connection of the stuff you were talking about is so, but you don't, you're very, not only interested and accepting of it, I, you do see real value in it. So where, how do you see navigating that line between being open and some of these modalities are uh, uh, fun, healing, uh, forcing us to confront our fears, our discomforts? I mean, how do you see that, that, that line bet between the two? If you see what I'm saying, the higher we might call a higher path of what sexuality can be, and you know. Well, I try to hold space for without judgment for every. I think our sexuality is as unique to us as our fingerprint. So what works for me is different than you, and I don't want to judge what someone else is into as long as they're not hurting someone else and they're not hurting themselves. Just because it's not right for me doesn't mean that I have the right to judge it or deem it unworthy. Um, you know, on a spiritual level, I, I do, you know, I am friends with a lot of the top adult stars in the world, and we include a lot of adult stars on the sex ed, and I think that they have a lot of interesting and amazing things to say, and are incredible human beings. And She has a great podcast, too, where she has these long <laughs> interviews with people that you would not normally have in-depth conversations. I, I didn't. So anyway, Well, that's just because referring. you haven't been over when I'm having a barbecue well, with like podcast, Riley Reed. So. Yes. I wasn't invited. <laughs> I think that everyone has a story and that everyone has something worthy to share. And I'm like very anti-elitism, as you know, in any form. Um, and I think that with porn, although on a spiritual level, like if I go to direct something behind the camera and I'm told, oh, let's look at this soundstage, which just happened recently, um, that was a porn set, I, like on a spiritual level, I really can't do it because I'm like, we gotta 
we're going to burn some sage and like yeah, my crystals in here. Like, you know, I get on, on a spiritual level, I understand, I understand that. I don't actually consume porn in my personal life because I'm so inundated, it, inundated with it for work. Um, and a lot of my friends who are adult stars, I don't, I don't watch their, that's not how I research them. You know, I talk to them as human beings. I understand what their experience is like. I want to know, you know, everything about their life off camera. Um, the same, same way I would with any actor. I wouldn't assume that like your president fits. You know what I mean? No, I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that there's so much like room for um, duality and colors in this. It's, it's, I, I just am not someone who's going to make a black or white judgment on any kind of sexual practice if it's not hurting another person or you and it's all done with consent. Um, because I've heard it all. There's like literally nothing that you could say that would surprise me at this point. I mean, there's some things, like I have a lot of friends who are sex therapists and work with, um, you know, necrophiliacs and, and pedophiles, and that is, makes me very uncomfortable. I don't think I could do that work, um, even if it's like rehabilitation, um, because I feel like that crosses uh, something for me. And then there's a lot of content in porn that I don't want to, consume, but I feel the same way about mainstream media. I'm very careful about what I consume. I don't watch anything that has rape in it. Um, that's my personal choice. Um, and sometimes I feel like, what is the difference between like a Game of Thrones, which has like hyper violence and sexual violence in it and something you might see on Pornhub? I don't know. I just don't draw such clear lines. And again, it's interesting coming from the family that we do. Um, being in that space uh, with people who are still performing a job in front of the camera where a lot of things are discussed before that camera starts rolling. Um, and I don't know. I've actually seen sex be dealt with a lot more. I've seen a lot worse behavior in Hollywood than I have in porn. I'll tell you that. A lot what, worse behavior that? in, in every in every way. I mean, when you're a famous person, you get away with everything. Um, you really do. I've seen some, I, I mean, there are people that are still, you know, above the name, above the title, positions of power that have done terrible things. And like that wouldn't happen in porn because it's such a closed community and there's so much discussion and there's testing and, you know, you, it just wouldn't happen. I see. Yeah. When so sex... Harvey Weinstein... I mean, he's one person who we know, like we know of, and I'm not going to be the person to like name name drop because you know, as we know, you take a lot of shit when you when you do that. But um, in in spaces where sex is communicated more openly, there is less violence. There are less instances for it when you compare it to like a, a media space like the music industry or the fashion industry or, or the mainstream entertainment industry where there's just not that protocol. You know, it's only fairly recently that there's intimacy co coordinators, as you know, on sets. That was like a very new thing. Um, you guys know what that is? Does everybody know what that is? Yeah. Well, no, some people don't know what it is. Well, so just briefly. It. So the way it had always worked when there was sex scenes in movies and television <clears throat> in a healthy functioning uh, c company, the director and the actors would have an in-depth, respectful conversation about what the scene was that involved sex, and you, uh, having been a director, and I've been on both sides of that, you would have a conversation about, here's what I'm thinking, and what are you comfortable with, and what, you know, everyone would get very clear in a, in a healthy, in a, good, in a good environment, and um, in a bad environment, it could be a whole lot worse where there would be, a, uh, uh, at, at, at best, a disregard for someone's frailties and sensitivities and questions. And, um, off, and sometimes, I would say fairly rarely in my experience, uh, you know, uh, uh, potentially predatory or really unkind, terrible behavior. So, but in the wake of the um, Me Too movement, um, in Hollywood, there was a new position over the past couple of years called an intimacy coordinator. So now it's mandated that 
anytime there's a sex scene or nudity of any kind or anything that where someone feels exposed or you know that there is a, a person who's been hired to be the liaison between the artists, the actors, and the director and the production, and, and who really helps essentially choreograph this, and who is the and I honestly have not I have both directed and acted in a lot of sex scenes, and I've not yet had the opportunity to work with an intimacy coordinator. <laughs> so I but I was kind of at first like that's my job as a director. Like what do I need a a third person coming and telling me how it's supposed to be and well because you know, but then I've learned to relax. I mean I get it, but it was a weird rea I was surprised at my own reaction. I was like, that's not I don't need that. Well, I mean, but also remember that you're a man. Yeah, so no, you were it. dealing it from the other side of things. Whereas like most of my friends who are actresses and successful actresses, they tell me terrible stories all the Absolutely. time about how much nudity was expected of them and, you know, being pressured to show your tits. And I remember as a kid hearing dad and other men all the time say things like, have we seen her tits? Like about an actress, a famous actress. Like, have we seen her tits? Oh, we've already seen her tits. Okay, we're done. We don't want to see her tits anymore. It was either like, we haven't seen her tits and we really want to see her tits. So she's fuckable. Like literally, this is the shit I heard as a kid. She's fuckable. Let's see her tits. And also, by the way, all around Hollywood, I heard this shit all the time. But if you showed your tits, then you already showed your tits. And so we're like done. Yeah, she's kind of like... We have, we've already seen her tits, so let's move on to a new pair of tits. Like your high school nightmare. It's pretty it's fucked up to grow up as a kid in that situation. So, you know, I think it's, I'm grateful for it. I think it gave me a lot of privilege um, to be able to come up in that space and to be able to be a voice for other people that couldn't say something because I'm not trying to, be, trying to be an actress and I'm not going to show my tits. Like literally there's one person who has nude photos of me and he's my best friend since art school and he's in this room. Um, because I'm that paranoid about digital privacy. But yeah, I don't know where we're at with, with uh, yeah, well, time. So, yeah, we're, we're, we wanted to save some time for questions. questions. So I wonder if anybody on uh, that you guys note have any about questions. being fuckable. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah? Uh, I think that's a really great question, and it's something I'm obsessed with, especially with the sex ed. Um, we've done a whole podcast on AI and sex and consciousness, and I developed the site to not take your data. Um, and I think it's really, I think our sexual and emotional data is a lot more valuable than people think from the information that you give dating apps or your relationship status, your, your gender and your, and your sexual orientation to um, menstrual, track, menstrual apps. If any of you use menstrual or fertility tracking apps, the ones that you, one that you should be using is called Clue, which follows EU data privacy. The EU has, a, which is European Union, has much better, stricter data privacy policies. I think it's really important that we ask questions about who's building the tech we use. Unfortunately, it's too late to reverse engineer things like Google and Meta because they're when. When product is all, meaning tech products, is all built by men that look the same, which is why we know with AI, you know, it's, it's built to recognize white faces. I think it's really, really important to diversify when in, in tech companies and build things thinking about the back end of what your team looks like if we really want to build products that are going to address exactly what you're talking about. So I do feel, I do feel hopeful. And I do hope that more um, artists and 
healers and um, community leaders and thought leaders engage in technology so that we can have safer tech in all forms. And even in, for example, in porn, there's like a huge wave of ethical porn, um, both with like sites and filmmakers that are making pornography and thinking about things like you pay for your, you know, your Netflix subscription, you pay for different subscriptions, but if you're not paying, you could, you can make the choice to pay for porn. If, for example, if you're concerned about like what kind of porn you're watching and how performers are paid. That's a great question. It's so personal, and I feel like healing is never done, right? Like we all think that there's some point where we're healed and we're fixed and we're saved, and we all want like a guru or a pill or a course or a book to do that. And I don't claim to be any of that, and I don't claim for this book to be any of that. I think that you have all those answers for where you're supposed to be at on the stage of the journey right now. And for me personally, I think my spirituality was not always aligned with my sexuality. It's really been a lot of work to get to this place. And that involved things like being consciously celibate for a while, to really be intentional about the way, about the kind of sex I'm having. Um, like I like to say that I don't let people wear shoes in my house because I'm so sensitive about, you know, the energy that, it's not about dirt, it's literally about you're walking around on the streets and that I'm careful about who's in my house and I don't know what you've picked up. So like, you know, if I'm a heterosexual woman having penetrative sex, I'm literally taking on someone else's energy. And I think that takes a long time to clear, for me, personally. Some people don't have that, They're, they can totally, you know, disconnect or separate and that's great. But it took me a while to, to really be comfortable with just accepting that I'm a bit of a sensitive freak <laughs> and a bit of a hippie witch and owning it, you know, and being okay to say that. Um, so again, I think for everyone it's a different journey, but I believe that we as a culture would be in a healthier place if we aligned our sexuality and our spirituality more, whatever that looks like. And that could be, you know, at the sex ed we have a lot of people who are, you know, of Muslim faith or, sex positive Christian or Jew, I don't think that your faith is, has to be separate necessarily. So whatever you deem as like a higher consciousness, because I think that that can only lead to more pleasure in the end. Who else? Yeah, yeah, back, yeah. I'm thinking about how, you know, as you started sex ed and you became, I think, more known for you know, your sex education, how that changed perhaps maybe how people perceived you like professionally, if that, ever, if that was ever an issue in terms of, like, I know sometimes sex can be seen as taboo and sex professionals seem as kind of separated from the rest of us sometimes. Um, Definitely. I'm, that's such a good question. It's honestly, until the last few years, it's been an uphill battle talking about this. It was that first, thank you so much for supporting my work since Pretty Things. Um, for example, it was hard to get like, fa like fashion mag. I had a career in fashion and stuff, but they didn't want to talk about sex. They didn't like that I want to talk about sex or strip tease or any of that kind of stuff in a serious way. And it's only been like in the last few years that we've seen more of a, like a widespread acceptance of talking about sex more openly. And literally only in the last three years have more people started to think about sex as an essential part of overall wellness, meaning mental and physical wellness, spiritual wellness. So I, I feel like um, for a long time it was tough and people did feel uncomfortable 
uh, even my friends who were most, you know, a lot of my friends were in a different space than me. They would get really freaked out with talking about masturbation or vibrators or pornography, or they would have a problem with um, other friends of mine who were sex workers, you know, but I think that I've really seen that change, which makes me, you know, so happy. So I hope, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I think we're in a very dangerous place. As I said, my first job was at Planned Parenthood. My mom took me to my first pro-choice rally when I was like nine. Um, I think what I wish that we had more education uh, and discussion around before, you know, this the last like f fucking six years of elections was really about things that, it, like the conversation was so centered on abortion, but it was, really was needs to be expanded to reproductive rights because what we're gonna quickly lose are things that I think a lot of um, Republican voters maybe would have not voted against, like I the access to IVF, um, fertility treatments, um, birth control, like all of these, all of these things which we take for granted are kind of wrapped into some of the next decisions that Clarence Thomas alluded to when he wrote, wrote his, his decision. So I think it's like a much bigger conversation than just abortion. And, and that's what like people like to um, point their finger at. But actually even like the fact that so many people were saying the word abortion after Roe v. Wade fell, people that like I saw like Upper East Side socialites that like have never been politically involved all of a sudden being like abortion, abortion across their social media. And I'm like, where were you 12 years ago? I mean, I'm great. I'm great. Join the party. Join the party. But I just, um, I'm nervous about what it means to have control over our bodies and our wombs um, in America. I think we're... We're not ever, I don't believe in my lifetime we're going to have sex education in schools, which is why I built the sex ed. I kind of knew that, you know, back when I was 13, right? I mean, you probably didn't have good sex ed in school. No. No. <laughs> I think it's super important if you're going to get involved in sex to be not only trauma informed, but to be hyper aware of all the politics around this subject. Who was it? Was someone over here raised their hand? Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to talk a little bit about consent. I'm 37 and I have my younger cousins who are like in their early 20s now who are, and I wonder if this may be why what we were talking about before, why people are having less sex, like men are scared. Um, and they're saying to me, you know, like, well, what am I supposed to, they don't get consent. They're like, what am I supposed to do? Like, film her before we hook up? And I'm like, well, it's something that evolves. You can't just like take a snapshot like that. So I guess going to what you were, first of all, how do we teach young people about consent? I think it's a lot easier when you're comfortable talking about this kind of stuff. But a lot of kids, you know, when they start like in college, it's also with a lot of alcohol, right? And so I guess I was wondering a little bit on your thoughts on how this talk around consent has changed. And then also since you just mentioned the sex ed thing, like I'm a kid of immigrants. There's so many of us who like our parents are not going to be having those conversations with us. Who does this fall on to have these conversations? Like who should be teaching these kids about this stuff? Just in the home? Or? I think professionals should be teaching it. Um, I think that we should begin the the conversation around body autonomy and consent when kids are little and teaching them things like, um, well, the way that we, I think a lot of people talk to kids about molestation and reporting abuse. So like naming naming your genitals, I think is really important using the real name for things and explaining like, it's okay to touch yourself. That's natural and healthy. That's something that you wanna do in private. It's not okay for you to touch Jimmy because, you know, especially when they're underage, but like explaining consent in that way when they're little. So you're kind of bringing people up you know, not just, I think it's really hard when you, when people are reaching like 25 and they've never had any of this discourse and then all of a sudden they're like, I don't know what to do. And yeah, a lot of men do, a lot of straight guys, I will say, um, don't 
they, they feel a little lost. And, you know, I feel for them, actually, because I think we do need to provide resources and education and meet people where they're at. Because it doesn't do anything to, like, shame people and say, well, you should figure this out and you should know the right words and you should have all the pronouns correct because there's a learning curve. And we're not going to change the paradigm without really um, breaking things down in simple language. Um, so the consent conversation, I think, should be, and conversations around sex, I think, should ha be happen before you're having sex and when you're sober, preferably. Especially if you're getting into any kind of kinkier sex. 100% sober. I know that's like not chic for uh, frat parties. I used to tell his daughters, actually I got, can I tell the story? I used to get, I got in trouble. You have no secrets in this family, so. I got in trouble because I told his daughter, my nieces, who are like 10 years younger than me, I told them when they were like in, in high school, I said, don't go to, don't drink, go to, go to frat. They were eight. They were not eight. <laughs> they were not eight. They, that is not true. You're making me sound like a b bad aunt. Anyways, I said I would way rather that you smoke weed and get tired and go home and like eat than you go to a party, like a frat party and get roofied and like drink some, drink alcohol. And he was like, you shouldn't be. And then like, years later, you said that that was good advice. It was. <laughs> so roll okay, your own joints a, you have a, or a bring question? a flask. Yeah. You, you, yeah. I mean, I think we need more representation of sex, of real sex in media. I love to reference a friend of mine who was on the podcast, Alia Shawat, who's made a great film called Duck Butter um, that she wrote and Miguel Arteta directed it. And it's, I think it's a really beautiful queer love story and there's real intimate raw depictions of sex. I think we need more sex that's like human and awkward and messy and not so perfect. Um, because we can't, like, that creates an unrealistic expectation, right, for us to live up to. And those are the moments, like, sex is messy and awkward and funny and bizarre. And there's, like, strange noises and, you know, all sorts of fluid flying around. Like, it's just not that sanitized. Um, I think that there are, I think hopefully, I think there are a lot of independent filmmakers making, like, cool erotic films, what do you think? Um, I agree. I, I think that, um, you know, in answer to your question, what's happened, I think people are really sensitive on the topic right now because of what's happened in our culture in the past few years. <clears throat> you know, at the same time, you know, HBO stars, these venues want to have titillating sex in their shows. So with Game of Thrones, you know, there's women are and men are objectified, but more women than men still, even though it's a great show. So that's still, you know, people feel self I mean, tickets. sex sells. But, uh, but I think that I've always felt, you know, like what, what Liz says about sex should be, you know, just as an artist, is, is such an amazing form of dramatic human connection. So any sex scene that I'm involved in, I want it to be a, a specific about what's happening with those two individuals in that time. I mean, the... The best sex scene, I, I, my favorite sex scene of all movies is from Don't Look Now, which was made in 69. Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, that film opens with this husband and wife having sex in the morning. And it's just what Liz said. It's silly and weird and goofy and it's intercut with them brushing their teeth and like t you know, going to the bathroom. And, and it's, I was like, oh, that's how real people have sex. So it's always amazing to me when it's depicted in a film or on television in something that feels like life. Yeah, or when people have agency over their nudity. Like, I love the scene in Robert Altman's Shortcuts when Julianne Moore is yeah. like having an argument with no, like, she just has a shirt on and it's like yeah. full red bush and she's just, you know, she's just such a badass. Like, that's a great thing. You know, we don't see those real moments. 
of, you know, someone sitting on the toilet or like whatever, shaving their pubic hair or doing things that are, we all do, yeah. right? Well, some of us wax. Some of us. <laughs> um, what is, oh, well, let's see, well, you, you raised one your hand first. More, yeah. Oh, we just have time for one more? Okay, I saw your hand first. Go ahead. I mean, for me personally, like the direction I'm going in in my work is very much towards masculinity because I think there's so much healing to be done. And um, I have a lot of like young boys in my life that I have, you know, a mentorship relationship with, like ranging from like 12 into their early 20s. And I like to hear like and a lot of them, especially in their early 20s, like the kinds of stuff they listen to is so far away from what I, what I listen to, and I think that's really it's really helpful for me as an as an educator to to you know to be challenged by that, to be challenged by having to again meet people where they're at and have discussions with boys and explain things like why it's important for them to know about menstruation if they're straight and why if they want to have casual sex they need to be like a bit aware of what's going on politically in this country or why they feel so threatened by um, anything that might be deemed less than masculine or gay. Um, I think it's really important to have, have those conversations and also meet that in my corner of the internet in the like super woke sex positive inter internet when I first built the site we actually were doing a lot of content geared towards men that if we put it on Instagram we would just get shaded you know it's like you can't win well I'm not allowed to use the word penis I'm not allowed to say I have you know I'm not allowed to use the word he or him and I but I think it's important I think you can be inclusive of everyone but also recognize that some people like you want them at the table you want to welcome you want to welcome them in you you don't want to make them feel like um, they don't have the education or the words to join the conversation. Um, so I think with masculinity, I think we're in an exciting place because I think that I've seen it personally with men, like a huge change that I that uh, men that I talk to. I feel like men are taking more interests and responsibility for their healing. And want to? They want to. They want to be having better, better sex. They want to be having better relationships. They want to have more support too. I just think we need to be offering them more tools and more alternatives to people like Andrew Tate. And I'd love to have a conversation with that guy. <laughs> I mean, not really, but like I kind of. I mean, I kind of. Listen, I went on um, bars. Do you know what barstool sports is? Yeah. So I went on barstool sports to promote this book, and they were really receptive. Um, and that is not like necessarily like the typical outlet that you might think of, but they were really hungry for this information and really into it. So I think you just you just never know. I mean, I think like the most like broy frat dudes, they still want to be having better sex, and they're still struggling along with all of these things like the rest of us. So yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to welcome them into the fold. Great, so I think that uh, wraps us up. So thanks, everybody. Um, yes, let's, let's give a round of applause to Tony and Liz. Yeah.